One of the things I'm most often asked after a gig is, why is six string bass? Um, because it's cool. No, so there are there are a number of reasons why you would play a six string bass and why you would play a five string bass. Uh, and we're going to talk about them now. So, number one, why a five string bass? You conventionally you're going to see a five string bass with a low B. So for those of you who don't know, a regular bass guitar is tuned E A D G. Uh, low B simply means you have another string still tuned in a fourth fourth below E, which is going to be a B. So that gives you access to just more notes. You get E flat, you get D, you get C sharp, you get C, and you get B. So you got more notes. What does that actually let you do? Well, that's going to give you a few advantages over just a four string bass. So for starters, if you're playing a song in E flat, for example, say you're playing Superstition, and you just want to jam along with that kind of thing. You can do all that E flat stuff, you can hang on that low E flat without actually having to tune your whole bass down uh, a half step to get to E flat. If you're playing like... You could play all of those songs in E flat without having to worry about retuning your bass. By that same example, you could play stuff in drop D that normally you would have to down tune for. You use a five string and then you can you can play all your drop drop D stuff in there and by extension drop C drop C sharp. The other thing it does is it allows you to play more positionally, not as much as a high C does, but you have an easier time going down the neck in a way. This isn't a great reason to do this because realistically you should be able to play in any position you want, any position you can think of, but say I'm playing, I don't know, like breaking up somebody's home. I'm in F sharp there. That was an easier time going then. Yeah, the other thing, octaves. You get all these nice low octaves that you can kind of use to, to simulate some of those really like low sub bassy synth lines that you get on a lot of pop tracks. So the biggest one would be something like Ain't Nobody. So I can get that low E flat. And again, you could do this on a 4, you could down tune everything, but it's a lot nicer just to be able to play it there. And that's me a bit... The positional shift there is a lot nicer as well. So yeah, low B. If you really like Dream Theater... So, why would you have a high C? That's a lot less common. That's much more of like a jazzy thing. So, why would you have a high C? So for one, you get access to a lot more notes. Particularly in this higher register. So you can do all your... That's like... You can go higher on a G string, but like... That's kind of like the note where I'm most comfortable still playing. But with a high C, you can get higher than that. You can obviously you can get up to like a fourth or a fifth higher than that. If I could play up there. You get more notes. You have an easier time playing lower down because you get... Playing in G there, I get to go up get to go up to that fourth a lot easier than so you get more notes you have an easier time playing solo licks and playing that higher register stuff also this might just be my bass but I find it a lot easier to bend 
isn't something you're gonna do a lot until you're soloing, but... That makes that an awful lot easier as well. Um, the other big reason, the main reason, the place of extreme bass, the actual reason I bought one, chords! Chords are awesome. Chords are great. As bass players, we don't get to play a lot of chords. Um, ever. Um, but they're really fun. Just, um, my favourite chord ever. It's in uh, A major add 9. Which is awesome to play on a 6 string bass. It's super cool. You get to hit your open A there. And you get to play the chord up there. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. That's the other one I like, the minor version of Shout Minor at 9. Then obviously you can still play some chords on a 4 string bass. You can get this kind of shape. And these shapes. So you get all these lovely shapes. All these lovely inversions you can start doing. All of that fun stuff. I'm going to do, hopefully, in the coming weeks, a video all about bass chords and how to uh, approach practicing them and how to have fun doing that. But yeah, chords are the big reason, for me anyway, for a six string bass. Um, whether you use them sparingly, you just throw in that midway through a thing, whether you use it as an effect. Um, whether they still, you just use it. But you have a much easier time playing in that position than if you had to, you know, do it, do it somewhere else. Another good thing you get with a high C, you get more nice harmonics. Harmonics are lovely on bass, that's like a well-known feature of the instrument, just harmonics are great. You get all that kind of stuff. You get all these nice, lovely harmonics that we really like on bass because they just ring forever. You put a compressor on, they just ring forever. They sound great. And you just get more of them. You get an entire other string of. just nice sounding harmonics which is great we really enjoy that we like that um so why would you not play a six string bass there are many reasons there are many reasons not to play a six string bass five five string is a as i say a lot more accepted most people aren't really going to turn turn the nose up if you play a five string bass unless you're playing you know like straight ahead jazz or blues hmm. like i do but uh <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, reasons not to buy a six string bass. It's expensive, like, six string basses, uh, a, a comparative level of this bass to, to the four string version that I own, or the five string version that I own. This was more expensive, purely because it's just more stuff, it's more wood. Strings are more expensive. Bass strings are already, some would say prohibitively expensive, if, particularly if you want to change them after every show, which a lot of rock and funk guys are going to want to do. Um, you have to buy an entire set of six string bass strings, and that's expensive. I think most, I think they're around 35, 40 quid, depending on where you get them from, if you have deals or not. But like, it's not something you particularly want to have to do after every show. Bad technique is really bad for you on a, on a six string bass, more so than bad technique on a five string bass. Let me explain. So, bad technique's always bad, you never want that, obviously, that's why we call it bad technique, no one wants that. But it's actually worse for you on these, because if you don't have good technique, you're much more likely to injure yourself, like, the necks are bigger, the chunkier, you're trying to wrap your hand around it, if you... Uh, from, my, uh, from my perspective, I've been more likely to injure myself with this than on a four string bass with, like, a thinner, like, P bass neck. Yeah, so bad technique is a lot worse for you. So you want to make sure you get that right or else pulling your wrist out like that or doing something silly, you are going to... more. I feel like you're more at risk of injury playing one of these than you are a regular bass if you have bad technique. So that's why we're going to talk about technique in a minute. Okay, so let's look at 
some technique stuff. So, as I said earlier, the first thing you've got to watch out is not to bend your wrist too much, because that's how you're going to get injuries. You're going to put tension on your wrist, on your tendons. You don't going to be able to play as well, and you've got a risk of actually injuring yourself. So, simplest way to deal with this is literally, whenever you're playing, just point your thumb at the headstock. This just forces your hand, you know, it forces your wrist to be straight, there, as you can see. This is all pointing this way. It may take a bit of getting used to. Your hand wanna it goes into more of this kind of sideways position. It helps if you use your, your fourth finger and your first finger when you're playing notes a tone apart. Rather than I'll just keep it all nice and flat, nice and straight, so nothing goes wrong there. That's the main point. It gets a lot worse down this end when you're making bigger stretches. When you're playing further up the neck, you can go into a more kind of usual position where your thumb is in the exact same place as the second finger is. As in you put your second finger here on the, ninth, on the, uh, on the seventh fret there. And you put your thumb just behind it on the seventh fret there. That's your usual kind of like four string position, your usual position that you go into. But the more, when you start going back further over here, that's when you kind of point your thumb towards the neck, towards the headstock rather. And I'm just to try to straighten out your wrist. Cause you can see here, when I'm in this position, my wrist is still pretty much straight. Maybe not quite as much as back there, or it's really up, but like I'm not out there. You know what I mean? That's kind of a normal position you're going to see. Uh, as far as like other technique stuff with your left hand, not a whole lot to talk about that's different from how you would normally uh, keep left hand technique. You want to keep all your fingers nice and close to the fretboard so you're not using... Uh, 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 you haven't got poor economy of motion so that your, your fingers are all nice and easy together. You can. You haven't got to use a whole lot of effort to get them in the right position. The other thing is using your your index finger here just to kind of mute the strings below. You can hear. I'm getting that note there, but the the strings below it aren't ringing out. They're not getting sympathetic tones because they're all muted by that index finger. You see, when I come up over here for some of the solo stuff. Or, you know, soloing stuff. Uh, the thumb kind of comes over the top of the neck. That's to get kind of a... That's more of a guitar thing that I picked up. That's kind of... So you get a better grip. So you can do... You can do bends. You can do a really over the top of the bro. That kind of thing. Generally, when you're playing more just conventional bass line things, down here you don't want your thumb to come up too much. But um, I'm not one of those old school guys that will like, you know, smack your thumb if it comes over the top of the neck. Because we'll see a lot of great blues guitarists, you know, or great, uh, you know, blues rock guitar players doing thumb way over, then way over the top of the neck. You can even play chords with it. It's not something you really do on bass too much, but you can play a note there if you wanted. That's more of a guitar thing. You see them play an F sharp down there while they're playing a D chord. You get this this first inversion thing. That's the side. So, right hand. This is where stuff gets a bit tricky. So. General bass technique thing, you want to have your thumb floating, as in, you're using your thumb to mute the strings behind the string you're playing on. So if I'm playing that G here, I've got my thumb resting on the D string, but it's going to mute that. So you're not going to accidentally have that ring out. Thumb's also muting the E string and the B string. So you can call this the rule of thumb if you like, but the, your thumb kind of floats around between the strings, depending on what string you're on. 
and it mutes the one behind it. Otherwise, it's resting on this pickup up here. And you can kind of rest your fingers on that thumb so you still get this nice raking technique where you put your first finger and second finger back on the string below it, kind of rests on that. But that's all regular technique stuff. You can find out about that anywhere. The thing that gets weird with a six string is if I were to play that same way of muting, playing on that six string, you'll notice maybe it's my thumb, maybe my thumb's just a weird shape, kind of almost double jointed there, but if I'm playing up there, that E can ring out. I've really got to move my my thumb in a really awkward position there that's unnatural to mute that E string. And that's something you don't want. And you will find, particularly if you start running like distortion or, or overdrive through it, that, that you're going to hear that, that E ring out with sympathetic tones. Sometimes you're going to whack it by mistake. Just kind of undesirable. But, so how are we going to deal with that? Well, I like to use the John Patitucci method, which is muting with these two fingers, your fourth finger and your third finger. So when I come up to this G string, that's when I put my fourth finger, put it on the E string here. So it's resting there. This finger comes out, rests on the A string. The, the E string is the really important one to mute for me, but it feels unnatural to just have your pinky there and your third finger like <laughs> weirdly floating around like some kind of weird claw. So that rests on the A string there. It's a really nice, natural resting position. And it stays in exactly the same place when I move up and play the C string. The thumb moves as it normally does. Thumb moves from um, the D string here up to the G string here. And then what Panatucci does is when he moves back over here to this D string, his he moves all his fingers. The, his fingers are always muting all the strings. It, he'll come back and he'll mute the B string and the E string. That doesn't really work for me. That's not how I've practiced. I prefer to have my fingers up like that. You know, so I can come and do some three finger things or I can keep them in a natural position there. So basically when I what I like to do is, is kind of a, a mix between the two. So when we go up to that G string there, I'm gonna hit the G string. Usually it's when I hit it with my second finger. I'll at the same time move those that fourth and the third finger into position. So I'll be first finger, second finger, first finger, second finger. Then thumb comes up up to this D string and the third and the fourth finger come across and they mute those strings there. If I have to use my first finger, then it will just be a two action thing, so I'll go. See what I mean? So it's easiest, it feels most natural with your second finger playing a note because then you just put those two right behind it at the same time. Otherwise, it's kind of a two action thing. I put my, play on my first finger and the other fingers come across to mute there. And then obviously the hand comes up. Fingers come up when I move down. Um, but that's going to mute the E string there. Your thumb's going to take care of that string there and your thumb's going to should take care of that B string there as well. Um, have an experiment, have a play around. Just um, The most important thing is find something that works for you that accomplishes what you want it to do in terms of technique, which again is just going to be consistent notes. Um, consistent notes that sound good, I'm going to reach your hand and mute all the strings. You can do consistently. Um, the only other slight thing about technique I'm going to mention is if you're doing chord stuff, you also like to do this kind of open-handed thing. Yannick Gustella, he's an amazing jazz player. He kind of constantly lives in this box. <laughs> he's constantly either doing this, and then when he plays you know, conventional stuff, he's got his hand in this kind of over-the-top position so that he can go back and forth between the two. Amazing, totally cool. Does I can't do it. <laughs> I have to go from... Um, but that's kind of just like an acoustic guitar, finger picking style, I'm muting slightly with the palm of my hand there on the strings below, but um, that kind of works for me, but you're better off just uh, 
Uh, yeah, employing acoustic guitar styles there. Um, and practice those by looking at more acoustic things, finger style things. I might do a video on that somewhere down the line. But yeah, that's kind of the basic technique stuff. Um, the only other thing I can think of to talk about with technique is, is slap, which is something I don't do a whole lot of, obviously. Because I'm shit at it. Um, that's just going to be practice. That's, I haven't really, there might be better resources to talk about slap. The most thing I've noticed is just be really careful with your thumb. Obviously, like I say, my thumb kind of, getting focused there, <laughs> kind of bends on the side, so I'd have a tendency to hit the string below it as well. So you kind of keep it, keep your thumb nice and flat. So you're only hitting the string that you want, but... You can hear that I got it. I accidentally hit the note, the string below that as well. Really good left-hand muting can kind of help you out with that, but um, yeah, just keep practicing. Try and be as accurate as possible. Or um, we'll be really lazy like me and just do a load of... I just do loads of hammer-ons and pull-offs and try and slap as little as possible, but... Um, yeah, that's everything for technique. Okay, my camera decided to die then for a moment, but that's fine. Apparently I reached the talking limit. Um, if you have like more of like a Rufus Philpot technique where your, your thumb's a lot closer here, maybe you won't need to use the, three, the third and fourth finger technique. As I say, there's no one-size-fits-all thing. Just make sure that you, you're really experimenting. Like when you're playing up here, you go back and you hit that low E string so you can hear and hit the low B and the low D. All of this so that you can hear whether you're getting sympathetic tones, whether the string's sufficiently muted to stop um, you know, any of these nasty extra noises come out. Because nothing kills a vibe or a funk like hearing just like you're playing in, you know. You know, just random notes that you don't want. So, here's some, like, kind of some rule of thumb things I've found. One of the really good things you can do with a, a low string, and this is, this is really the how to do it without your band hating you part of the video. Um, cause you can really piss off some band members by doing this stuff too much. So... Example, I play in Bank of Catfish, which is a blues rock band, but we do a lot of straight ahead blues stuff as well, where five and string bass, not particularly uh, necessary, shall we say, or applicable, but you find moments to make it work. So, for example, if you want a really big impact, like you've just had a, a break, you know, like, like you get to the end of a section, you stop, you really want a really big impact in, you can use some of these low notes. Like if we're playing in... B, amazing, because you know, you get to the end of a song, you you get to slam on that low B, where you make a big impact uh, of coming in at that particular section, you know? It's like hitting the low string, the low D in a, in a drop D song. It just feels good, you know? It gives a, every, everyone will look at you and give you the stank face. You know, that's that's always nice. That being said, you don't want to overdo that. If you start every section, with a big, big fancy low B, um, it loses its impact. One, one and done, one per song. You know, that's kind of how I feel about big old bass fills. If you're in a regular, you know, not showy um, band, you're just playing like some straight ahead. You know, just playing something like that, you're just kind of grooving along, galloping along. If you're gonna do like a big shreddy ripping fill, I'm gonna do one. Do one in the whole song, because that one moment will have a big impact. It'll be, whoa, you just did this crazy fill, that was amazing. If you do it twice, it's, oh, you did it again, okay. You know, you lessen the impact um, of, of what you're doing, unless, like, that's the whole point. If you're playing in, like, the aristocrats and you're just gonna shred the whole time, <laughs> you know, like Brian Bell. But, like, generally, once per song, I think, is is about right for big impact notes, for 
using all your high C and giving it all the, you know, shreddy, shreddy, shred. Uh, that kind of thing. So, other rule of thumb, be really careful with chords. Really careful with chords. Because not all of them are going to sound good. This is more of a problem on a, on a four-string bass, because obviously you have fewer note choices, and you have a much... Um, the space from where the notes sound good, where the chords sound good, is lesser. There's less room to do it. So, generally, that's as low as you can go. That G there, while still sounding good, at least for that position. That's what my, my old bass, bass teacher used to tell me. Just, that's about as low as you can go. The moment you start doing, like, it just gets muddier and muddier. It's harder to discern the harmony. And that's a fairly open voicing. If you do like a closed voicing, then I think that's already starting to be even muddier and, you know, harder to discern. If you get down here, I don't even know what chord that is. It's just sludge. Doesn't matter. Like, um, so yeah, that and G minus 7, there. That's about as low as I think you can get away with. Um, so there's not a whole lot of room to work with on a four string bass. On a six string bass, obviously, you've got. I'm gonna take my tune. Check my intonation. Remember to do that as well. Check your intonation, kids. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's, um, yeah, be really careful where you place them. Open voicings are much better than closed voicings, particularly if you haven't got the sixth string. But if you've got a sixth string, you can do all this. All that, that's a big chord. All that kind of closed voicing stuff will sound good because you're high enough that it won't get muddy. But like, on a four string bass, you're better off doing, you know, open voicing stuff. As in, um, notes, the notes are all more than a third apart. That kind of thing. That's gonna sound better, that's gonna sound less muddy. muddy. You get to really, like, hear the quality of the chord a lot more. Practicing. Practicing on a six string bass. Always be looking at technique, as we discussed earlier. Play in lots of positions. So, cause the the real, <laughs> I remember my um my bass teacher at ACM, Joe Hubbard. He gave me the story of uh, a guy came up to him with a six string bass, and so it was a fairly new thing at this point. And he goes, "Oh, that's cool. Why have you got a six string bass? So I can play everything in one position." And then and, and Joe gave him a scary look because that's it's not really what you should be doing. You need to be able to play everything in every position. Because, like, sure, you can play D as just... You can play it all there, but... And that's fine. That's totally doable. But you also need to know how to, you know, play it in other positions like that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you need to be able to know how to do that for various reasons. You know, if you're changing chords, you don't want to go, you're going to have an easy time switching to a chord in a different position. If you want to solo and get up higher, you're going to have an easier time going from up here to from. You know what I mean? It's going to be easier to go from in a similar position down here, so you need to shift around. It's just good practice as well. You learn all the names of the notes, learn all the chords. Practice in all the positions. Like, never learn anything in just one position. If you're learning... You know, that, uh, that G minor arpeggio there, learn it. Learn it that way as well. You know, practice everything in multiple positions, because it'll make things a lot easier, a lot better. Learn the instrument a lot more. If you're gonna do what I said earlier, and use play songs in E-flat that are normally down-tuned, make sure you practice them before you do. 
I think that sounds kind of obvious, but I've definitely gone, I've definitely rocked up to gigs going, oh, I'll just play it on the six string, and then go, actually, um, I should probably work this out slowly. Because you get very used to playing it in one position, which again, is why you should learn things in multiple positions. It makes transitions easier. Um, yeah, practice them. Practice them before you do that. And just practice playing drop D songs in, you know, in that position. I mean, the last thing I did, there's a Dream Theater song, uh, is it On I Father, where he tunes the B up to a C, so it's a different position thing. I just, I learnt it like that, and now I'm going to learn it, you know, in the, the regular tuning position, because why not? You learn it in two positions, you get to practice your hand in a different way. I don't have to tune my B up to a C and watch it explode every few minutes, you know? That kind of thing. Um, and the most important thing, surf the song. You know, if you think the song is going to sound better and you're going to get the point of the f and the feeling of the message of the song across better by doing a nice, you know, you know, weird chord thing, that's cool. If you think the song is going to be surfed better by you just going, then do that. Do what serves the song better. Do what's going to make the song feel better, sound better, get the point of it across more, you know? Like, do you really need to play the D there? You know, is it a particularly dark song? Is it driving? Is it metal? Is it powerful? Or is it like... Is it that? Is it more laid back? Is it more still driving but not nowhere near as heavy, you know? You can... You know what? You gotta serve the song. You can't just use it just because you got it, unfortunately. Um, uh, so there you go. There's some observations, some ideas, some, some practice ideas that I've got just from now playing this thing for a, a couple of years, I think, playing it in a variety of different um, scenarios. Just my thoughts on six string bass. So remember to like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> Remember to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, if you want to see more tutorials like this, leave a comment. Tell me what you want me to talk about. Um, more covers coming soon after that. Leave a comment telling me what song you want me to cover. Uh, I don't do requests, obviously, but um, I may think it's a good idea and do it anyway. Just steal your idea instead. Um, but yeah, like, comment, subscribe. Share the video. Thank you so much for watching.